When I think of Halloween and envision trick-or-treaters, classic horror films on the TV, and haunted houses, I feel excited. That in and of itself is a reason why we, as people, generally like scary stories. It's not the feeling of fear, it's that there's a depth of emotions that can happen. Suspense, anticipation, it's exciting. I remember a writing teacher I had in 8th or ninth grade, when I was attempting but failing to write like Edgar Allan Poe, talk about how ghost stories are not just about trying to scare someone. Historically, they've helped children learn life lessons and build courage, and as people sat around campfire sharing stories like this, they helped develop a sense of community. Tonight, in the first of a two-part Halloween special, the tradition of telling scary stories continues. Friends have graciously agreed to share some of their favorite Halloween stories with us. This is A Study of Strange. Welcome to the first part of our two-part Halloween special terrifying tales. I'm Michael May. In this series of episodes, I'm going to have friends and colleagues share some of their favorite scary stories. And they run the gambit. There's everything from personal paranormal experiences. There's a short story that's going to be read. And in next week's episode, we even have an account of a UFO sighting, which I'm really excited about. I do want to make one announcement before we get into things here. I have kind of like an additional Halloween special episode, which is separate from these terrifying tales. It's an in-depth interview with Tom Holland, not Spider-Man Tom Holland, but horror filmmaker icon Tom Holland behind uh, things like Thinner and Fright Night and The Langoliers and Child's Play. And that was really fun. It was such a thrill to sit down with Tom, talk about his career a little bit, and also interview him about his brand new book, Fright Night Origins. So if you want to hear that, I'm going to release it probably a few days before Halloween. So subscribe to the show so you can get notified when that episode drops. So I don't want to spend too much time doing housekeeping at the beginning of Halloween special episodes. So let's get into it. Our first story tonight is from my friend Nick Peterson, an amazing filmmaker. He's done these vibrant and creative and kind of crazy in a good way short films. He's known for music videos and commercials. And the story he's going to tell is a personal experience he had on a road trip in the 90s with a friend, and it's quite bonkers. And I got to say, if you're listening to these in chunks, make sure to listen after his story, because I have a follow-up with some research I did on the phenomena he experienced. And that's all I'm going to say for now. Enjoy. With me right now is Nick Peterson, filmmaker. What are you what are you best known for? Is it your music videos or commercials? You know, what I'm best known for changes depending on the year. I used to be best known for short films. Mm -hmm. Then I was best known for car commercials. Mm -hmm. Now I'm best known for music videos. Yeah. For a time I was best known for feature film stuff. And it it's like you learn, at least I've learned in my career, that every three years or four years you have a new what are you best known for? Of course. And I'm just course. rolling with it. So right now, it's music videos. That's good, though. You got to roll with it out here. You got to roll with it in the business. But you do like scary things, spooky things. I, I know your work pretty well. And you do have a an edge, a visual quality. Not It's not Lynchian, but there is there is a certain Nick Peterson style to things that I appreciate. And because of that, I did want to ask you to be on this episode telling scary stories because I was like, oh, you've got to have something, even if it's made up. And sure enough, you responded like you do. Yeah. When, when you called me about this, um, yeah, I, I have a, 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 a very personal, actual experience that happened that I've told my kids and they didn't believe me at first. And then I called my friend Josh, who was with me, mm -hmm. just unprompted. And Josh told them the same exact story. Oh, wow. And, and that's why... Like, I know what we saw was real because we both saw it at the same time and we both saw the same exact thing. If I was by myself, I wouldn't have believed it. But since we saw this thing twice in one night at the same time, both of us, it, I mean, it, it, it's real. Like this, it's out there. Okay. So this when... is legit. I, I'm not even making it up. Yeah. 
This is legit. And I and I'm a stone sober kid. Like there's no weird drug history in my life. Um so this is this is real. And when did it happen and where was it? Probably 1994. Um we were in high school and Josh and I we used to travel a lot in his uh he, he had a really sweet when a like a like a a VW bus. Nice, nice. He, he had a sweet. He was like the rich kid of the family, or the, or the of the. He was like the rich kid of the neighborhood. So he had a, a sweet Land Rover, and he flipped it, and almost killed like seven kids. Oh my goodness! But they, no one died. And his parents got him a, a more mediocre car, which is this VW Westphalia, brand new. So mm-hmm. we traveled all over Utah with it. And one night or one day, we drove down south to St. George, Utah. We lived in Provo, Utah, because mm-hmm. Josh wanted to hook up with our friend's sister. And we get to their house and we, we cook chili outside their house in the van, played some banjo, and the girl never showed up. <laughs> and it's around, you know, maybe like 11 p.m. on a Friday night. And we're like, well, what do we do now? We didn't want to go home because that's boring. So we thought, well, we should just drive across the state. We'll just drive east from St. George to Indian Creek, which is on, on the other side of Utah near Moab. And it's about a six hour drive. Okay. And this is before GPS, Google Maps. We, we, we just had a map. So we're like, yeah, why not? And it's around like 11 o'clock, maybe midnight this time. So we went to the gas station, we fueled up. And I, okay, I know I just said I don't use drugs, which is true, but we did grab some trucker pills because- What are trucker pills? <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, you know, before Red Bull, which didn't exist in 95, yeah. you get these little packets of like, you know, they're trucker pills that keep you awake. Okay. Because okay. dude, we, we had just driven, you know, three and a half hours from Provo down to St. George and, you know, ate chili and played banjo. And, you know, it's like 11 o'clock or midnight and we're going to drive across the state and we don't want to get into an accident. But trucker pills do not make you see things, right? Okay. But it okay. kept us up so we could survive the, the drive. Yeah. So we're driving along the Northern Arizona highway that goes east, which kind of dips in and out of Utah, but mainly stays in Northern Arizona. Mm-hmm. And we're maybe like an hour and a half, two hours into the drive. And then we see this guy on the side of the road, right? Middle of nowhere. There's nothing out there. This is past Fredonia and a few other places. And we see this dude and that's, you know, it's weird. And he's hitchhiking and we're driving, driving, driving. And as we get closer to him, we see this guy dressed in all denim, right? Denim pants, denim jacket, but the dude has no face. And when I mean no face, I'm talking like no eyes, no mouth, no nose, and he's hitchhiking. So Josh and I, it's just the two of us, we start screaming. And we both said at the same time, I said, Josh, dude, did that guy not have a face? And Josh like, dude, that guy had no face. And he had no face, right? So we're freaked out because we both saw the same thing and we're driving, you know, we keep on going and I lie to you not again, this is maybe three hours later. We saw him again, same thing, same outfit, same pose, hitchhiking, same no face, dude, all on the same night. Okay. So, so the faceless man appeared two different places hours apart on foot i guess or maybe there's more of them i don't know dude so all was it the same jay leno-esque all denim dude all same exact thing okay same pose like thumb out in the air hitchhiking and what was the was the face skin color just skin color yeah yeah okay oh yeah just but it had like a texture to it it mm-hmm. wasn't like smooth it was not like, like alien smooth you know it's like i don't want to say marked. i mean we we're driving like 70 miles an hour yeah but still dude yeah faceless man Ooh, you wouldn't want to see that if you were hiking out there no dude i swore i said josh dude if i see that guy for a third time i'm gonna run him over Mm -hmm. i'm gonna kill this dude because this is not a real thing but apparently it is (laughs) (laughs) uh now can i ask was the the hitchhiker was it moving at all or was it stationary he's standing there he's standing there could He's it, not moving. Could it have been some sort of cutout, like a promotional thing? Like no, dude. This is nineteen. Like I said, this is nineteen ninety five, mm-hmm. and this is this is like a highway that nobody goes on. I forgot the highway number. Yeah, but it it just it starts in Saint George. It kind of goes the, the southern part of Zion, past Colorado City, past Fredonia, 
and just goes out there, northern Arizona, and eventually goes, you know, it leads you north up, up into Utah when you're way east. But no, this is not like a highway. This is like a two-lane highway. This isn't a freeway. Like, nobody is out there, dude. Yeah. Except for this guy. Like, I bet you, like, we probably saw, I mean, I don't remember exactly, but now, now I'm thinking about it. I mean, you don't see anyone driving past you either. I mean, you can drive in the middle of the two lanes for miles before you ever see anybody Mm -hmm. to get over into your lane even. Yeah. It's that desolate. Like, there's nothing out there. I I mean, this has obviously had an effect on you because you've even shared it with your kids. Do you have any theories? Do you? I mean, because you keep calling it a dude, so you actually think it's like a person. But dude, could there this be... is a dude. This guy was like six feet tall. Like uh-huh. this wasn't a woman. No, yeah. this was like a guy. But was it something supernatural of some kind? Like it's in three hours apart, no face. Dude, that's what we don't know. Yeah, <laughs> we don't. I mean, I don't think the faceless man has a car, right? <laughs> So he's just in case I cut around this, I will yeah, tell yeah, the audience that. Uh, well, I'm just going to say it in case we use part of this. So Nick has try attempted to call his friend Josh to have Josh also confirm and tell the story, and he's in a meeting because he's a lawyer. But he did text no when uh, when Nick talked to him about the faceless man. That's hilarious. <laughs> I was calling for a confirmation. Yeah, <laughs> but no, but that's the thing. Is like. Like, Josh, again, he's a really smart dude, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, smart enough to be, like, a real lawyer that makes money. Um, Like, we're not making this up. Yeah, of course. And we both saw it. It wasn't like, I don't know, dude. He had a nose. No, it was, like, (laughs) the same thing. Now, the weirder thing is I did AI prompts about it just Mm -hmm. recently. And the AI is, like, 90% exactly what we saw. Yeah. That's it's so weird. Do you mind sharing that so I could post it oh, when the episode comes yeah, out? I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. totally send them to you. And it's just so weird. Now, the, the one thing the AI didn't get correct is that the AI did a sunset, mm-hmm. but it was pitch black dark. Yeah, so the AI didn't pick up on that one. But the same, like, you know, like the stature and the face, and the AI made, like, like a more of a white mm-hmm. face, like like ghost white. But now he's, like, fleshy. It's fleshy like, color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will share yeah. that uh, in the show notes and probably post it on social too. Oh, totally. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing the story. Yeah. That is and a that's a freaky one. The, dude, the the whole thing of seeing him twice is kind of the thing that really sticks that's, out. If to it me. was once, we would have been. I probably wouldn't tell anyone. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna believe it. I mean, not that people believe this one, but I bet you, dude, he's been seen by others. There's no way. There's no way, dude. Maybe it's like a group. I don't know, dude. Maybe there's a whole like a colony of faceless people that live in the desert. Hey, maybe they listen to the podcast. If you're a faceless person living in the desert somewhere near Arizona, Utah border, uh, send me an email, a study of strange at gmail.com. <laughs> They'll have these stories about like young kids getting you know, freaked out. Yep. Yep. <laughs> scaring people on the highway again for fun no thank you so much that is a that that's a good one that is a good story i really appreciate you sharing that because that is that is a good one that i'm going to be thinking about it's going to stick with me i think just in my own imagination dude this happened over 20 years ago and i think of it often oh man like it is not left i believe you i believe well thanks thanks again thanks dude before we move on I did a little digging into this faceless hitchhiker that Nick Peterson talked about because I had a, I had some theories about what this could be. Suffice to say, I was doing some research, and a faceless hitchhiker is actually a very common phenomena. This is actually a thing that many people have experienced late at night. Generally, from what I've found, this happens in the Midwest, typically Ohio. It seems to be a bit of like a local legend. However, I find it so fascinating that this is not just a unique experience from a couple of guys out on a road trip. So I may have to look into that more and maybe even do an episode about faceless hitchhikers in the future. Now, moving on, our next story I'm putting here in the lineup because it takes place in Utah. So there's some commonality with location. And this is from Matt Glass, who is one of the greatest people on the planet. I love Matt. And he's also one of the most annoyingly talented people in the entire world, and he has... This is kind of like a historical account of something very strange. Most importantly, before anything, Matt, you composed the music for A Study of Strange, the podcast. 
That's correct. Yeah. I, there. <laughs> I like how I just asked that as a question. Did you, did you compose the music that I've been yes, using? Your Honor. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very well. Uh, no, no, we thank it. you so much. And it, it, I do include a link to your work in all the show notes of the episode. So people, if you like the music, check out Matt's work in the show notes. Yes, please. Thank you for coming on. I've been wanting you to come on an episode for a while. So this is a nice, this is a nice way to dip your toe in because apparently you're going to share a story that is based on factual research. Yes, I did research. <laughs> See, it's an audio podcast, so no one can tell if I'm doing air quotes or not. It's true. It's true. You have to use certain inflection in your voice. Yes. Um, so yeah, do you want me to tee anything else up or you just want to dive into it? What do you want? I guess we can just dive into it. Go for it. Jump on in. Diving in. Okay. The very top I wrote this on my notes. I wrote story for Michael's podcast. So. Ooh. Okay. Uh, I grew up in Utah, which is a horror story in itself. No, just kidding. Mm-hmm. It's great. <clears throat> Utah, northern Utah near Salt Lake in a town called Ogden. And one of the, have you been to Ogden? Probably not. No, I've been through Salt Lake and Provo and some other places, but not. not oh, okay. Ogden's a little bit further north. Okay. Junction City. We'll get into Ooh. it. Um, the largest peak in Ogden, I think it's the largest, it's called Ben Loman. It's, uh, well, most of the Rocky Mountains go north to south. This is mm-hmm. me doing visual aids again. Mm-hmm. But Ben Loman goes east to west, and so it like kind of intersects with the mountains a little bit. You get like, yeah, this like sort perpendicular. Of okay. Exactly. So it kind of stands out when you are driving up the. I-15. Check your Google Maps. Um, Ben Lohman, it's like, yeah, like I said, it's the most noticeable thing in Ogden. And Ogden, Utah is, it used to be called Junction City because, you know, Promontory Point where the they were building a railroad from the West Coast and the East Coast and they met together. Oh, okay. Which is a thing. And then they met in Utah. It was Promontory. Yeah. Promontory Point? I don't know how to say it. It's not that important. But like any train that was crossing the United States had to come through Ogden, Utah. So it was like Junction City. And then I wondered if perhaps it wasn't just a junction for trains, but perhaps a junction between worlds. Dun, dun, dun. They don't put like put my music right there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I'll I'll make a cue for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, in the early 1800s, uh, this is before any white folks had really settled in the area. Uh, people would go there as to trap, but it wasn't really settlement, so it was big business for trapping and fur trading and stuff like that. But Ben Loman wasn't such uh, wasn't a place people went to for trapping uh most of the trappers were terrified of that place it kind of had this weird there were just a lot of interesting myths and stuff that people okay. talked about in the ben loman area it was a lot of talks about how the woods would mock them and they'd laugh like repeat them their voices at them and they'd hear sounds and horrible scary things and, and that it would scare trappers i guess that'd be pretty bad to scare a trapper hmm so the big fur traders found it bad for business apparently from what i read So uh, I can't remember the name of this trapping company, but they said for every five of their men that they would enter that woods, only four would leave. And the survivors would talk about how confusing the canopy was because it was so thick, the trees and their compasses wouldn't work properly. Oh, Um, they'd hear like if someone got lost, they would hear their friend yelling and calling their name. So they would call back, try to find the guy and be like, hey, I'm over here. But every time they would yell at him, his voice would get quieter and quieter until he was just gone. And that was bad for business, so fur traders decided not to trade there. But in 1945, there was a man called Miles Goodyear who actually built the first fort in Ogden. He was kind of the founder of Ogden, I guess, even though it was founded later on. Doesn't matter. Right. So did, oh, you you know say, I didn't... did you say 1945? 1845. 18, okay. Yeah. Just to clarify. Oh, in was 2005, when Utah was... Found, no, yeah. <laughs> I forgot to mention, a uh, funny thing about uh, Ben Lohman is one of the founders of Paramount is from there, and it's thought that Paramount Mountain was based on Ben Lohman. He, like, drew Ben oh. Lohman on a thing. He's like, this is what our logo should be. Interesting. Which is something my dad would say all the time. He's like, nice. oh, Ben Lohman is the Paramount logo. Anyway, to give you an idea. So in 1845, a man called Miles Goodyear, who built Fort Buenaventura, which was the like the founding area of Ogden. He was a trapper and he was successful there. While everybody else would fail or was scared of it, somehow he was able to do it, never had any trouble, never got lost. But he was a loner, so people would be like, how did you do that? Let me come with you and see how you're doing this. And he'd be like, no, I have to do this alone. I have to trap alone. And because of that solitude, people started to spread rumors that he made a deal with whatever this horrible demon or ghost was that was in the woods. 
And those rumors were also bad for business for him because nobody wanted to buy his cursed furs. So it didn't really work out that well for him either. Even though he wasn't killed by the woods, it did end up kind of ruining his Hmm. career. And time passed. People got lost in those woods again, over and over again at the base of Ben Loman. But it was so infrequently that nobody like made the connections. It's just like people get lost sometimes. But it kind of happens the same way. Like a child gets lost in the woods, like the trappers and their family would come to the rescue screaming out their names and they'd hear the kids crying. What with each response, the cry would get quieter and quieter until there was nothing. And then on August 27th in 1962, there was an eight-year-old named Michael You're Taylor. Who <laughs> doesn't have your last name? That'd be weird. Yeah. And according to articles from the time, he loved to play hide and seek with his friends, but he would only play outside because he was claustrophobic and he wasn't good at hiding indoors because of that. And so he would want to play outside all the time and he hid really well. And on August 27th, he went out with his friends, hid. They looked for him for several hours, couldn't find him. And so they, the other kids went home to their families. And like, we went to play in the woods. He's hiding. He's doing a great job because we, we don't know where he is. But And then so the families and police and local authorities got together and they entered the woods. His mother, of course, was leading the charge, screaming out his name, hoping to find him, you know, screaming so much that she couldn't speak at all. And then days went by without finding him. Uh, three days went by because on August 30th, there was an earthquake one of the largest recorded in uh, Utah history. And yeah. as the dust settled and everybody collected themselves, uh, young Michael walked out of the woods seven miles from where he was lost, exhausted and malnourished. Uh, his mother was told and she went to the hospital to meet him. Uh, and when she entered the hospital room, he started screaming at her, yelling at her to get away. He said, I'm sorry, I chased you. I'm scared of the dark, things like that. And just like she couldn't be in the room with him. And according to him, when he talked to the police, <laughs> He was running through the woods, chasing his mother, who kept calling out his name, but she she just would keep calling, and he would get closer, he thought, but then her voice would be further away. And then she entered a cave, he said, and he was too afraid to enter the cave because of his claustrophobia, so he just waited outside, hoping she would emerge. He told the police that she was so mad, this is a kid thing, he said she was so mad that she shook the earth, and so he you know, blames his mother for the earthquake. And, earthquake, yeah. And so he just ran away. And uh, I think the local newspaper wrote articles about it. And people, you know, the myths about the Ben Loman forest, people knew about it. So a couple of, like, enthusiasts read the stories, maybe talked to the kid. It didn't go into that much detail. But they tried to retrace his steps, and they found the cave, apparently, where he, he was, they, they assume. And in the mouth of that cave, they found some old bone fragments uh, but they couldn't go any further because the inside of the cave had collapsed, I guess, from the earthquake. Oh, yeah. I don't know what was in that cave. Nobody knows what was in that cave. But, uh, and who knows what the kid, you know, it might not be the right cave. Who knows what the kid was talking about, what's going on. But uh, I looked up that in 18, no, I'm sorry, 1987, at the University of Utah, a couple students did a study of the area, just knowing these like old myths and stuff. Mm. And they used sound mapping equipment. And this is the best that I could uh, understand it. Like they would measure the time it took for like their pings to bounce off the mountains and stuff like that, like yeah, echo location yeah. type stuff. Mm-hmm. And they discovered this weird phenomenon. Apparently, because of the composition of the rocks and the weird L shape of the mountains, it's like a parabola type curve. Okay. Uh, th- it, the way the Ben Loman hit the other Rocky Mountains created this weird, sophisticated acoustic filter that carried sound to one specific point on the hillside, which is surrounding that cave. Oh. So the echoes would, it's like those sound machines that they use at football games. So they come yeah, to point yeah. at a machine and would all enter the mm-hmm. same point. So when the kid was lost or any of these people were lost, for example, the kid, um, his mother would call to him and he would hear her voice coming from somewhere else. So she was trying to find him and that attempt to save him was pushing him further and further away. Away, yeah. Until he found himself at the cave. And so... I mean, the sound that she hoped would save him brought him closer to death and starvation and the cave. I wrote that for some reason on there. Um, That's good. So there's like science behind what could have possibly been, but like it's clear that you can read it as like the mountain feeding on love and support from people looking for lost people in the woods. 
which is the, I think, the trapper from the beginning of the story. His secret was that nobody cared where he was hunting. Nobody cared about him because his his hunts were silenced. He had no issue because the mountain, the mountains don't want loners. Yeah. So that's. So if you want to go in the mountains, don't have any friends. <laughs> At least, at least those mountains. So did you hear about this growing up? Is that why you thought of this? Or is this something you came about later? Uh, later. Just yeah. through research. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Oh, that's, that's really cool. I, it's oh, got the strange. history. It's got the local lore and legends. And it's got it the science behind it. It has all the elements uh, to a, a very good strange tale. That's like that's yes. like the kind of thing I would cover in the show. So I, I really appreciate nice. that. That's I'm going to look it up. Can you send me a link to some of that? Well, you can and cut can this share... out yeah, or not cut this out, but I made up the entire thing completely. So <gasps> you're not going to be able to find articles on this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am going to keep that in. I think that's nice. really important to have. No, that was that's amazing because <laughs> it actually, it sets up really... Like a There's, like a local lore type thing. That's really yeah. Interesting. I tried to build it around actual ideas about the mountain yeah. or like scientific things. Like Ben Loman's real. Uh, mm-hmm. The people I've discussed are real. Not the kid who got lost, but I'm sure somebody got yeah. lost somewhere. Oh, of course. It's definitely a phenomenon where like mountain mountain echoes oddly. So if people are it, it can make it difficult to locate someone because of the where the echoes yeah go. the way sound sound travels. And the earthquake and... was a real thing. Oh my God, Matt. Matt, sorry. <laughs> Happy you Halloween, guys. I'm sorry. Happy Halloween, indeed. No, I love it. Thank you for for doing that. I really appreciate the twist. The nice. twist. Yeah, the, the twist turn. of the story is that the yeah. story doesn't exist. The only thing I'm disappointed about is I literally was gonna go like research this tonight because that's what I do for fun is look these things nice. up, and I would have been like, "Where did you hear this? Like, what did you do? I can't find anything." <laughs> yeah, you guys, you, I must be really good at research because I found it yeah. all. Yeah. Now, uh, before you go, we can we can plug some stuff for you. Yes. Obviously, you're a musician. Links for that are are in the show notes. But you also are the co-director of Ghost of the Ozarks, and we had Jordan on a few episodes ago. Oh yeah, I uh, heard that that uh, episode. Well, so. thank you for listening. Uh, and people can find that movie for rent pretty much everywhere. Ghost of the Ozarks, which you co-directed, and you also uh, wrote and co-directed a movie called Squirrel, which is on Tubi right now. So that's correct. Yeah. People can watch those check, things. Check that out. Check out Mac, Matt's work, um, Mr. Please. Glass. Uh, yeah. I'm well, thank you me. so much. Thank you. Anything yeah. else you want to add? Am I am I skipping over anything? Am I jumping Just out? Just have too a good fast? time. You know. Good man. Good. Look me up on Spotify if you want to listen to stuff. Yes, please do. All right. Thanks so much, man. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Well, Matt definitely got me on that. He was dropping all sorts of hints that he had made that story up, and I didn't pick any of them up. Uh, but that was awesome. So next, we have Simone Kissel, who runs a production company on the East Coast called Magic Dog Productions, and their mission is to empower women and other marginalized artists. And Simone is going to read a short story from a writer she works with. Hi, Simone. Thank you so much for being on. And Thank you so much for having me. You're in New York, right? Yes, I'm just north of New York in Stamford, Connecticut. Okay, so you're you're all the way from the East Coast joining us. Uh, so oh, yeah. you're going to read a story to us today. So can you can you tell us a little bit about it, or does that give too much away to say anything about it? Mm, uh, I, I don't want to give anything away, but I, I mm. can tell you that it's uh, written by my resident writer at my production company, and she's based in Scotland, uh, originally oh. from America. Uh, So she's got a really exciting and unique perspective on um, some American things in Scotland. Oh, that's amazing. This is The Devil's Pulpit by Alexandra Grunberg, and it was originally published in Tales from the Moonlit Path. Lottie's foot slipped on the wet red clay coated step, and she supposed this was something resembling fun. That was what her mother demanded that she do, something resembling fun. She also demanded that Lottie make a few friends, but all she could manage was this outdoor adventure group. These people were not quite her friends, no matter how many hill walks they triumphantly concluded or hidden waterfalls they discovered, but maybe they were something resembling friends. And when your leggings were streaked with thick red mud, that was all you needed. Here, said Dahlia, reaching out her arm as a natural handrail for Lottie to right herself. 
It happens to everyone. Don't trust the stone steps. It's easier if you walk a little to the side. Thanks for the tip, said Lottie. She followed in Dahlia's footsteps, placing her boots in the muddy imprints that found natural support beside the staircase that brought them further from the light, but closer to the thrilling sound of rushing water. She was pleased to see that Dahlia was also wearing unfashionable wellies that went up to her knees. They seemed incongruous on a young woman with a half-shaved head of black hair and twin piercings embedded on either cheek and along the curve of her ears. They belonged more on an uncertain postgraduate who thought she had the ability to explore Scotland on her own and found out quickly that she did not. She needed someone else to drive on the left side of the road. Do you need help down? asked Byron, already reaching up to her, black nailed hands offering a strong support so Lottie did not land so hard on the jagged rocks. Dahlia was already taking pictures on her phone. Wendla and Marcus had their arms round each other, long blue hair entangling with a spiky short red crop as they tipped their heads back to take in the immense gorge they just crawled down to explore. Lottie snapped her jaw shut when she noticed it was hanging open, but she could do nothing about her wide awestruck eyes. The rocks rose high on either side of them, split by rushing dark water that shone red in the shallows where light hit the pebbles of the river floor and black where it pulled deeper before racing off between the, between the deep green vegetation covered rock walls around them. Purple flowers sprouted from the green, but quietly in a way that meant Lottie could only know that they were there without being able to point them out to memorialize in a photo, but she could not bring herself to pull out her cell phone from her pack. I know, said Byron smiling. Know what? It's hard to take a picture, he said. Feels like it would cheapen it, take away some of the magic. He was right. Lottie blushed, swiping a hand through her brown hair. Her mother did not demand that she leave it natural, but Lottie assumed she would be mad if she shaved any part of her head or messed with colorful hair dyes. Taking a picture doesn't ruin the magic, whispered Byron, like he was sharing an important secret. Though from the way Wendla and Marcus smirked at her, it was obvious he was not being quiet enough for it to be much of a secret. The magic is here whether we come or not. Everyone get together, demanded Dahlia. Lottie found herself squeezed between Byron and Wendla, a black opal ringed finger resting on her shoulder, a tarot card themed necklace digging through the layers of shirts and dumpers. Lottie was chilly, but Wendla had already stripped off her jacket, showing off a watercolor style tattoo on her upper arm of a woman in a flowing robe, a cross and a moon floating above her head, a pentagram suspended beneath her pointed feet. Her mother also demanded she find a nice church to attend. Instead, Lottie had found this group of hill walkers who would never set foot in a house of organized religion. They preferred to adorn themselves with their favorite religious aesthetics while they debated the corrupting influence of power as they walked, apparently unwinded, up the sloping paths of Scottish hills that Lottie suspected were actually small mountains. Dahlia took the picture and gave an approving smile, lower lips split by a silver ring. Lottie let her head fall back and stared up at the jagged rock edges, stripping water that trickled leisurely to the river at their feet. The gurgling of the stream, catching and skipping over large stones and around the fallen tree branches that formed a makeshift bridge to the shore on the other side of the gorge, sounded like whispering, an incantation. Lottie wished Dahlia would put her phone away. If she closed her eyes, it was almost like she stepped back in time or threw a veil to another world, far away from cell phones and smirks and demands to act in ways that meant nothing to her. But this place meant something to her. This was the kind of place she wanted to find. So this is the devil's pulpit, she asked, opening her eyes. Only Wendela was still beside her, eyeing the water like it was a poisonous serpent, as the other three adventurers splashed through the car with careless abandon. Byron and Marcus did not wear appropriate footwear, and they did not seem to mind their soaked boots and socks. No, we have to wade to the pulpit, said Wendela, glancing enviously at Lottie's boots, but it's not that far. We've all been here before. Lottie was not sure if that was an accusation, and she did not have time to interrogate the comment because Wendela was already hopping from fallen log to slightly protruding stepping stone, arriving on the other side surprisingly dry. Lottie followed in her steps, glad to have a path to follow, and glad to be here, even if it meant being here with people who only resembled friends. She did not need friends, but she needed this, this water, this red clay and black river, this green growth accented with purple. She needed this, more than she needed to breathe. And as she followed the group along the shallow edge where the water met the side of the gorge, she had to remind herself to breathe. Her efforts were rewarded with the smell of earth and growing life and something thick and almost sour. Unwelcoming, but pleasant nonetheless. Magic. It must have been magic. And Lottie smiled, and then she could see it. 
It was not a terribly large stone, like the overwhelming sides of the gorge, but it was an odd stone, growing out of the rocky base in a series of layers, red and brown and white and gray. Dahlia scrambled on top of it and tossed Byron her phone, a reckless act considering the water that cascaded beside her, but he caught it without difficulty. Take my picture, she laughed. Byron obliged, and then Wendla and Marcus were climbing up the pulpit to the base that was clearly not meant to hold so many people. Lottie walked through the water, nearly falling as the current pulled at her legs, demanding that she follow its needy design. But she managed to resist the pull and step from submerged stone to submerged stone until she reached a small perch on the other side of the water, away from the pulpit and the laughing group. There was a waterfall here. Again, not large, not imposing, but inspiring all the same in the way it turned from brown to black to bubbling white like spit catches, catching at the edges of a gaping mouth. Lottie, shouted Dahlia, and she jerked her attention from the waterfall to the five figures crowding together at the top of the rock, muddy leggings pressing against a metal studded belt, black fingernails curling around an aesthetically pleasing but meaningless tattoo. Take our picture. Lottie unzipped her pack and pulled out her cell phone, more careful than Dahlia, more aware of how the current could sweep anything it wanted away. She crouched down to get a better, a better angle to capture the moment and the lovely scenery around them. She clicked and clicked again as she captured the magic in the small invasive square of technology, locking in the image of the red stone and green walls, Dahlia, Byron, Wendela, Marcus, and the fifth figure that had joined them on the rock. Dahlia was the first on the pulpit to see the new member of their group, though she felt him before she saw him. The sharp black nails digging into the art so meticulously pierced onto her arm, now dripping a new splash of red. The others did not seem to be able to move as they fell under his fire-hot eyes and piercing claws one by one, their feet planted on the pulpit, their mouths gaping in silent screams. And through it all, Lottie took picture after picture, keen to complete the act that Dahlia demanded she perform. Her mother demanded that she go to church, get a good education, make friends, but most importantly, she demanded that Lottie go as far away from her as possible and take the darkness she attracted with her. Lottie had flown across an ocean to an island across the Atlantic, and she wished she could tell her mother what Byron knew, that the magic was there, whether Lottie was or not, whether anyone was or not. It did not matter that Lottie was so far away from the woods that she used to explore at night outside their house with its own unwelcoming yet pleasant smell. Magic was still there, waiting for no one, existing on its own, it did not matter if Lottie was here or not. There was magic in the devil's pulpit. Though, she smirked as she admitted to herself, magic might not have manifested so directly if she had just stayed locked in her dorm room instead of traveling with a bunch of ignorant adventurers to chase fun. The eyes of the adventurers, now half fallen from the rock, looked so shocked, Lottie could not help but laugh. The sound did not echo, but was swallowed by the thick green plants and the hiding hints of purple. Why should they be so surprised? What kind of sermon did they expect to receive at the devil's pulpit? Lottie unzipped her pack to put away her phone, but her cold, numb fingers lost their grip and it dropped into the water. She sighed, frustrated, but not overly upset. When you went to places like this, you risked a certain amount of loss. She waded back through the water and almost envied her discarded not friends. At least they did not have to attempt to make their way up the stairs alone. She hopped up the first few steps and then had to grab protruding rocks and roots to hoist herself up. Her foot slipped as she belatedly remembered that she should not trust the obvious steps, that she should have looked for the footmade path next to the steps. But it did not matter. A cold hand supported her back before she could fall very far, the claws surprisingly gentle as they pressed into the fabric of her jumper. For one moment, she let her weight fall back, let her body be supported by this phantom hand, by this creature she did not dare to name but thought might be something resembling a friend. Then she reached for a branch and pulled herself up, leaving the figure behind her. Nice. <laughs> so you mentioned right at the top of that, that this was originally from Tales from the Moonlit Park. Is that what your path? Moonlit Path. Tales from the Moonlit Path. And what is that? It's a horror, dark fiction, and speculative fiction online magazine. Perfect. Okay, that's what I was hoping it would be. That's awesome. Exactly. I'm going to look that up later. Uh, yeah, and, and tell us Alex's name again. Alexandra Grunberg. Alexandra. Grunberg. Alexandra, spelled normally, Grunberg, G-R-U-N-B-E-R-G. -E nice. And, and what made you think of that? Like, what is your connection to this story? Did you just like it or were you searching for something? I've, I, I'm a horror filmmaker. And one of the things that I really like um, 
is this concept of a horror the horror things or the horror tropes potentially being your friend. Like mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. because they're spooky or they're monstrous doesn't mean they're evil. And yeah. that in most content that's horror based, it's like the spooky thing is evil. And I like the idea of communing with the quote unquote evil spirit at the devil's pulpit and finding something familiar, something more familiar to her than the people she hikes with and her own mother and mm-hmm. finding kind of a kinship there. I just think it's, I like when my horror is also cute and sweet. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I, I like when horror just tries to do something different. You know, that that's my main thing. And also horror can can exist in so many different levels and it can mean so much and it can be metaphors for so many things. So I, I really appreciate the the story and Alex's work. Um, and do you want to plug anything about yourself before we go? Is there anything you, you want to do? You want to have people find you on Instagram Do you find some of your work? What do you what do you want? Yes, thank you. I would love to plug my business, Magic Dog Productions. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple of feature films out on video on demand platforms like Tubi and Amazon and Roku and Kings of Horror. And the one that we're most proud of and most excited about is called Bugs, a Trilogy. It's a horror antholo- a feminist horror anthology movie, um, sort of in the style of the 1975 Trilogy of Terror. It's out mm-hmm. there for free. If you like to see women not be only the victim in, in <laughs> horror, that's out there. And then we also have a couple shorts that will be premiering on Shorts TV in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. Oh, um, nice, so Magic Dog nice. Productions across socials and our films are Bugs, a Trilogy and Housed on uh, Video on Demand platforms. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Moving on, we're going to wrap up the show with three different people sharing some stories of paranormal or alleged paranormal experiences they had. First up is Curtis Anderson, an actor and an old friend of mine, and he's going to share some stories of a house he lived in as a kid and also some experiences as an adult. Curtis's entire interview, full of even more paranormal experiences than he's going to share here, is going to be available on Patreon because we actually talked about a lot of things he experienced and it was just too long to include in the episode. So be sure to check that out. You can find that on our website, studyofstrange.com. And now, here's Curtis. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Where do you want to start? Is it the house you lived in in Milwaukee? Is that right? Yeah, I think I think there's probably a little bit of context that needs to be mm-hmm. laid out a little bit. And, and it's important to know that I have a deep family history with unusual phenomena. And I should start right off the bat by saying you and I are in agreement as far as being skeptics who are ready to uh, ready to experience something and ready to mm-hmm. be ready to be convinced. Right. Um, but when I was younger, because of what I went through as a child, I was really into the paranormal. In fact, when I grew up, I thought I was going to be a paranormal investigator. And back in the late eighties and early nineties. UC Irvine actually used to have a course in parapsychology. So you could get a degree in that. So when I was in junior high, I was like, that's what I'm going to major in. That's where I'm going to go, blah, blah, blah. Now, of course, as you get older and you learn more things, all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. (laughs) <laughs> orbs are bugs like you know what i mean like all, yeah. all of a sudden things that were romantic and mysterious all of a sudden become mm-hmm. extraordinarily mundane so i kind of lost that but it doesn't change the fact <laughs> that all of these things actually happen so i will preface this by saying everything i tell you is exactly how i remember it happening and there aren't really good answers for any of it so i used to live in milwaukee wisconsin and uh, and the house that we lived in was one of the oldest on the block. And it was a two bedroom, one bath, basement, and attic. The basement was finished, because you can do that in the Midwest. And the attic was one that you could stand up and walk in. So it was essentially like a three-story house, but everything that you lived in was on the main floor. My parents had weird things happen in that house all the time. We, we were uh, putting, we had a walk-in closet in the bedroom that my sister and I shared. And we were putting hooks inside the closet to like hang stuff up on. And so my dad was going to the wall looking for studs. And while he was knocking, he knocked shave and a haircut Oh, yeah. And then through the wall, we heard just 
two repl- two slow response knocks. Mm-hmm. And we thought it was my mom. So we ran out of the room to go get her. And there was nothing on the other side of the wall. She was, in fact, in the basement doing laundry in the laundry room. So she could not have responded. Mm-hmm. And that was really weird. And as a kid, seeing your parents' faces get really concerned out of nowhere for something simple that you thought was simple, that sticks with you. Mm-hmm. That sticks with you. In the basement, there was an office that had like accordion doors uh, to separate it out. It was, it was, it was a lot of house for, for what it was. <laughs> and um, my parents always told me to not go in there mostly because it was my dad's office and he's an engineer. So there was like, there were, there were sharp things. There were soldering irons. There was, there was stuff that I could hurt myself on, but I always felt like there was something in that room. And so I told my parents that I was scared of the vampire in that room. And one day I went down into the, the basement by myself and you might be too young for this, Mikey, but do you remember the clip-clop horses? They were plastic horses on springs, and you would ride them. And oh uh, yeah, in like front of grocery stores and stuff like that. Is that what you're no? It was it was actually for home, so it was something that you could oh, do, okay. and and you put a nine volt battery, and it would make clip-clop noises as you bounced on it. Okay. Okay. Well, as I was going downstairs, all of a sudden my clip-clop horse started clip-clopping, and. I ran up the stairs past my mom and she was like, what happened? And I said, nothing, nothing, everything's fine. She went downstairs and saw the horse bouncing as, uh, as, as she got closer to it before it stopped. So that was, that was freaky. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there was the time I was in the bathroom. I'm, you know, six years old. The way the house worked was it was a bedroom, a small hallway with a bathroom in the middle and then the other bedroom and then directly across from the bathroom was the kitchen. And I was brushing my teeth and my mom called me from the kitchen and I responded to her. But when I looked back at the mirror, my reflection was still brushing its teeth. Oh, oh. And oh, that, that's, in- that's interesting. That made me afraid of mirrors for a good couple decades. Yeah, I never did Bloody Mary as a child because yeah. uh, that, that sticks with you. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. not one of the typical sort of tropes of personal experiences. You don't hear something like that very often. It, uh, it is even talking about it now. <laughs> Yeah, it 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 just triggers all all the all the goose pimples. Uh, it's it's uh, it was it was really really freaky. That house was scary. It was just kind of scary. And yeah. there are other things that we kind of half remember as mm-hmm. a family, mm-hmm. but I don't talk about as much anymore because I can ignore or disregard a lot of the other things like there used to be strange lights there would be times when we would be out in the backyard at night and we look inside the house and you would see like what looked like fireflies flying around in the room it could have actually been fireflies you know what i mean weird knocks uh which could be anything there were there were times when i was convinced there was something outside my window which made me very nervous about windows for a very long time but that can just be a scared kid you know yeah yeah what, the stories I just told you were the visceral memories. So how long did you guys live in that house? Do you know? Uh, yeah, we were there from 78 to 85. Um, okay. But yeah. starting in starting in 83, my parents were looking for a place to move to. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then my dad got transferred to California. And that yeah. ended up being the saving grace because, yeah, yeah because that's when, that's when we were actually able to get out Far away. Yeah. <laughs> far, far, far away. Yeah. Half the country away. So uh, so your next 
bit of information or stories uh, happened in Edinburgh. And I imagine this is probably when you're an adult. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. 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 So, so this is interesting then, because now we get to hear some, we got to hear some memories from the childhood and now some stuff as an adult. And especially in Edinburgh, which is kind of like historically a very spooky city, you know. <laughs> it's spooky. It's spooky, right? Like you're predisposed to wanting to be scared. And yeah. To be fair, a lot of these things were on tours that were also adding to the spookiness, mm -hmm. but I understand this setting the mood, getting the vibe going and, uh, and just, you know, getting ready to trigger folks so that they have a really strong reaction. So I'm kind of immune to that part. Mm -hmm. So everything I'm going to tell you about is the stuff that I truly can't explain and that I saw with my own eyes. We did the Edinburgh Ghost Tour, which I highly recommend. It's a lot of fun. It's a spooky city. It's got lots of stories. Mm -hmm. And they have these vaults underneath the city that are amazing. And you can tour them to this day. You can do a regular tour and you can do the ghost tour. Of course, I did the ghost tour. Mm -hmm. um, we go in via... Uh, you go in via uh, one of the main plots in... in like on the high road, which is which is old town, downtown. And it's a big gated thing. It's meant for a lot of traffic. Uh, and it's underneath an office building. And uh, we got in to the loading lobby. And uh, the, the, uh, the guide started telling us all the prep stories. And it's just kind of like, okay... <laughs> I get it. You're laying it on thick, buddy. Like yeah. I was ready for, I was ready for like the fog and organ music. Uh, but all of a sudden we start hearing a noise above us and it sounded like a chair being dragged across a wooden floor. That's easy to brush off. It's a chair against a wooden floor. And, uh, and so the host is like, but there's no one above us. <laughs> and it's like, sure, buddy. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so the tour hadn't started yet. So a couple of us went out to go look. Sure enough, you could see inside the area that was directly above the lobby. We saw the chair in the middle of the floor. And there wasn't anybody in the room. The lights were off. It was done. So unless they were super fast and they would have to be very very fast because it's not like we were we weren't minutes away we were seconds away it yeah. was up the stairs and out and it wasn't a very big room it's not like it had a lot of exits or anything and the front door was definitely locked because a lot of those old buildings they have to chain closed so it isn't just it isn't just in and out there was nobody there and there was a chair just dragged to the middle of the floor that's the easy one. We're continuing the tour. And they're setting us up. They're like, there's a little boy who's in the thing. And uh, and uh, sometimes people get pictures with him. So people were taking pictures all over the place. And then somebody got pelted with a stone. And uh, and it was a, a blonde a blonde American. And she got hit with a, with a little pebble in the back of her head. She turned around. She was like, what the hell? And we all turned around and we actually saw and hand to God actually saw little stones flying across the room. To this day, I, I don't know. I just, I just saw them go and they came at us, several of them. Mm -hmm. And the host was just like, apparently he doesn't want us here. We should probably just move on. And so we did. That was freaky. That was, but it was also really, really neat. It was really, really neat because at that point, when you see things move on their own, you're like, oh, that, that is not something I understand. Mm -hmm. That somehow physics has changed in this small area. And, and, and it's enough. It was enough to, to pelt us with, with like six to eight little stones. Yeah, it was freaky. Those are amazing stories that definitely are 
unexplainable, uh, you know, as of as of right now. Which it's is, the it's the reason why they stick with me so hard yeah. is because how does that work? I appreciate you sharing stories that were very personal to you. Thank you so much for doing this, Curtis. We'll talk soon. And yeah, it was great. Thank you so much. Truly my pleasure. I'm happy to be back at a time. <laughs> oh, oh, one second. Uh, I forgot to say, where can people find you? What do you, what oh. do you, do you want to put anything out there? Absolutely. So yeah. uh, uh, people can find me uh, on the Instagrams, which is where I actually spend most of my time. And that's Curtis Anderson. A N D E R S E N. Uh, and also <laughs> look for me and Mikey in Squirrel on Tubi. <laughs> Tubi That's TV. playing yeah. right now. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And yeah, nice, nice. I got a I got like a partial plug myself out of that. So that's great. Hey, I'm just saying. Yeah. One team, one goal, man. One <laughs> exactly. team, one goal. Lift yeah. everybody up. Uh well, thank you again. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Next up, we have actor Anna Lilly, who, similar to Curtis, lived in a house for a period of time in her childhood in the Midwest that wasn't quite normal. Anna's entire interview, unedited, is also available on Patreon as an exclusive episode, so be sure to check that out. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, of course. Thank you for asking. (laughs) Uh, So you are going to tell us about some experiences you had in a couple of houses growing up. Yes. So I'm, I'm guessing these are like paranormal or could be paranormal activity yes. in, in a way. Yes. Oh, this is exciting. Yeah. The first house, um, how we came to live in these houses is they were my, gran- my grandpa's house. And um, he lived in this old house in the corner of town. And we were building a house and the sale of our like our house we were living in went really quick and so we didn't have anywhere to live so we moved in with my grandpa in his house um before living in there I always just had like I did just feeling when you're in the house it was just like like you could feel that there was something else there Uh um in his garage when he moved in he found like a trap door in uh, cause they converted the garage into a bar. And so there's like carpet and stuff there, but you could pop it open. And when you go down in there, it's like this whole other world underneath the garage. Yeah. And he found some like interesting stuff in there. Some really old stuff, a doll, shoes, a key, like just random little things. But every time he'd go down to, uh, show people this, things would be moved around or things would be missing. And then they would appear back. And the only people who knew about this was family, but nobody else at that time lived there. Um, So we moved in and my parents had a room upstairs and my older sister and I, we were young. um, We had to sleep on the couch in the living room. And we, I thought it was a dream until my sister started talking about it the next day. And then I realized that her and I saw the same thing. We woke up in the middle of the night and there was a little boy standing at the bottom of the stairs staring at us. And he was looked to be in like older clothes, like a jacket. He had a hat on, but he had he was holding a rifle that had like a spear at the end of it. And I was just like, I saw it and I was like, nope, and rolled over (laughs) to the. So I wasn't looking and like I just, yeah, I just thought it was a dream. And then the next morning, my sister woke up and was telling my dad about this um, boy she saw. And my dad's like, "Mm, okay, whatever. Um, So then from there, other little things would happen. And you kind of just are like, "Mm, I don't know. Like we'd be sitting in the kitchen and the paper towel would just start unrolling. And it wasn't like a breeze caught and it kept, it was just like, it would roll. And then I'd roll some more. It was like somebody was sitting there playing with it Um, in the bathroom that was right off the kitchen. You'd be using the bathroom and the paper towel roll would just start unrolling the same way. And it's like you're trying to justify why it's happening, but it's just happening there. Um, One day when my dad, uh, he used to be a hairdresser, we were standing in the dining room. and he was doing my hair and my grandpa had this massive dining room and 
with these really tall back chairs that do tip over easily, but they need to be pushed to tip over. And we were just standing there and one by one, the chairs just started falling, like somebody was walking behind them and just pushing them. And both of us just stood there and my dad just like unplugged the stuff and picked me up and we just like walked out of, he like carried me out of the room. So that's, I think when my dad started to be like, okay, something is like not okay here. Uh, And one time we had a cat and my grandpa had, my grandpa owns, um, like he owns a lot of the land and a lot of the uh, like buildings and stuff in our small town. And Mm -hmm. so one of the rooms off of his bedroom is his office, but it's just like locked and with all like the deeds and paperwork and all that stuff. So nobody goes in there. He's the only one with a key. And one day my stepmom was home by herself and she could hear like a crying noise. And she kept like, you know, searching around and trying to figure out um, like where this crying was coming from she finally followed it upstairs and into the room and she's like listening in and it sounded like a baby crying in like on the other side of the door so my grandpa comes like she calls my grandpa and is like something is going on they open up the door and our cat comes out and the door's not ever open so it's like how the cat got in there how long the cat had been in there we don't know but it was just yeah it was just a it, those are the types of things that would happen. And then as a family, we'd all congregate when we would have um, like fi- family dinners or people coming over to like other family to come over to visit. We would all just congregate in the kitchen and chat. I feel like that's always the place everyone always stands. Mm-hmm. And there's a window above the sink in the kitchen. And I always would just like look out the window because I always felt like somebody was looking in on us and watching us. And I just had that feeling and I just kept looking over. And this was like over multiple times of us congregating in the kitchen. And then one night my uncle is just like, does anybody feel like somebody's watching us? And everybody was like, yes. And so we all kind of agreed on this, that like some, somebody was there. Um, My uncle put a lock on, there was a, like a cellar door off the kitchen and he went down there once and then this also confirmed my sisters and I's story of this boy is my uncle went down in the cellar and he saw the same boy down there and so he put a lock on the door like I don't know if he thought that was gonna stop it or whatnot but (laughs) but then like we came back and the table was in front of the door like nobody was allowed to go down in the cellar anymore so um Yeah, that's like some of the stuff that happened in that house. My grandpa didn't believe us that it was haunted. Like we told him over and over again. He's like, no, it's not. And when he moved out, another couple moved in and they turned the lower half of the house into like a gift shop. And then they lived on the upper half of the house. And they, there was an article in the newspaper that they kept reporting that every time they came down, like certain things would be moved Um, There's one picture frame that always got moved to like a different shelf and they had somebody come in to see if it was haunted and they confirmed that um, there was, you know, a spirit that lived in the house and they do believe that it was part of the Underground Railroad at one point. And um, because there was a very small uh, pass through Northern Illinois Um, and they do believe that, uh, that house and one other house in our town was like holding, um, people who were passing through the Underground Railroad. Uh, so there was a whole newspaper article about it and about how, yes, there's a spirit in this house. They ended up bulldozing the house down and now there's like a medical center sits on top of it. (laughs) But my grandpa to this day still doesn't believe that the house is haunted. Yeah. So, and then he moved into another haunted house. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we lived there for a little bit with him, so. What, it, was it similar type of activity or was there something very different no, about what would happen? The other house was um, the maid ended up uh, hanging herself in the attic. Uh, so it was a very old Victorian house. So it had like this tiny maid steps that went down to the kitchen. The basement was creepy. There was a bomb shelter, like the ground started sinking in. And then my grandpa found out that there was a bomb shelter uh, 
Yeah, in his yard, and that you could reach it from the basement. Uh, mm-hmm. There was like shelves in front of it and stuff, and so they pulled it aside, and he ended up filling in the ground and everything like that. But yeah, the stuff with at that house was just like you go into the bathroom at the end, of, and the hallway curved too, which was weird. So like you'd go down yeah. the hallway, and it would curve off to the side, and then it would be the door to the attic to go upstairs. Um, and there was a bathroom at the end of that hall. And you go inside and it was like always a thing where you just like look behind the curtain because you just felt like somebody was in there with you and you didn't. So when my sister and I, we only lived there for a few months in between like our apartment and moving into our house finally. And Mm -hmm. my sister and I would bring a boom box into the bathroom with us when we had a shower because it just like helped us feel like whoever was in there wasn't going to bother us. Yeah. So it was just more that type of stuff that was in that house. So my first reaction to all this, believe it or not, is that these houses sound amazing. Like they sound they so cool and so interesting. Um, they are. I, Bill and I have talked about filming in the current house that my grandpa lives in, the mm-hmm. old Victorian house, because it's just it's super interesting. And just this, the structure of it is so old, like with the maid steps, with the curved hallway. Um, there's also a playhouse in the backyard but like kind of far away and it mimics the house and so it's like but our pro like the that house used to be like it's on the highest point of roscoe Mm -hmm. and um so it sits on top of this hill and it used to be like there was a lot of barns and stuff there was a track there they used to show horses there so when we were at the the reason our house took so long to build is because they had to stop digging because they found bones. And our my parents' current house is built on top of a horse burial, like a horse cemetery. <laughs> uh, and this is Illinois, correct? This is Illinois. This yeah, is northern well, the, Illinois. Yeah. There's something about the old the old houses. I mean, A, they're older, so more stuff has happened, you know, and if yeah. you believe in this kind of stuff, there yeah, mm-hmm. that means there's more potential energy and history and all that kind of stuff. Yes. But uh, yeah, I'm just I'm fascinated now with with these homes. I just love the the idea of them and what I've pictured in my head. Um, and it's funny that you have a cat story because my first thought with the paper towels is What's that it's cat? something like a cat would do playing yeah. with the, with the paper towel roll. So the the like I'm j- just because I'm not sure what to call it, but the like crawl space that you first uh-huh. mentioned near the bar underneath area. the garage, underneath the garage, yeah. He actually found a doll in there. Yeah. He found a doll. He found a shoe, like, um, you know, one of the shoes that where you had like the little key where you'd pull the button through, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. an older shoe like that. It was all younger. It was all kid stuff that he found down there. But he did find like an actual key, which we don't know what the key is for. Or we never found out what the key is for. But there was always just random stuff, a pair of glasses. Mm -hmm. Like, like reading glasses kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's interesting, and that that terrifies me because I'm afraid of dolls. So just the idea <laughs> of going down into a space below a house and finding a doll just it just freaks me out so yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. It's and interesting mis- because it's like basements are a thing in Northern Illinois. I know mm-hmm. they're not very uh, prevalent out here, um, but these weren't like your typical basements. They were like this. They were like having a basement under the garage isn't normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I mean, I guess the cellar is normal, but it was yeah. a very small area the off the kitchen. So well, I was going to say, especially it being an older home, that makes sense to have to have a cellar. And also, if it was part of the Underground Railroad, that could be a potential place to hide people if anybody's looking. Yeah. So it makes sense for a home like that to have a space like that. Yeah. Now, keeping a doll down there is that's just a bad decision. Like even if yeah. you have kids and you're letting them play down there, don't let them keep dolls and crawl spaces no. and well, basements. Well, we weren't allowed and... we weren't allowed to play down there. Like we were allowed the one time to go down and look. And mm-hmm. then like any time we do this my grandma's like, "Yeah, I went down there to show somebody else and this is what I found." And so it was like but for some reason he still didn't and he doesn't think the house he lives in now is haunted. Yeah. He's just <laughs> 
It's it's the power of belief. I've been talking about it during my paranormal episodes because now I, I'm more of a skeptic, but I want to experience something. I love the stories of it. Yeah. But it's like when people don't believe, they don't believe. And when people believe, they very much believe. It's, it's a really yeah, interesting I, thing. I also feel like if you don't believe, like there's a part of you that's closed off to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm a believer that like uh, you won't experience it unless you're open to it because why would they waste their time trying to contact somebody who doesn't believe over making contact with somebody who does believe Mm -hmm. and being able to whatever it is that they're you know still here for so yeah yeah thank you so much anna for sharing your experiences yeah and do you want to plug anything before you go do you want to talk about your social media do you want people to find you anywhere you don't have to i mean if people want to find me on social media i'm always down to meet new people um it's just anna beth lily is my handle so all one word all one word yeah awesome well thank you so much and uh yeah i'll talk to you soon all right great thank you and last but not least concluding part one is matt mazzani a producer and director who's a a fantastic storyteller and i don't think i need to tee anything up about this one enjoy it feels very official. It's like I'm a professional. And I'm so excited that you actually showed interest in doing this because I love your voice, Matt. You have a great voice for this kind of thing. Oh, thank you. No, I I, I, I like I like hearing my own voice too, to be honest. <laughs> if I had to be completely honest. Uh, so I'm happy to get a chance to just bellow out a, a, a scary story. Yeah, yeah, please do. So what you're going to talk to us about is a it's something that really happened to you. Is that correct? It really, it really happened to me, and it's going to sound, it's going to sound like I'm going to be goosing some of this up, but it is like it, it happened like this happened, and this is like what we really like. This is our, the, the feelings that we that we had of this was were very real, and it's going to sound stupid, but this was like the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. Well, I'm I'm sorry it was a frightening experience, but I'm excited to hear about it. Yeah. Better rip. So. We were, uh, it was me and my friend, my friend Joe Barnett, and this is in college. This is, we went to Adams State College in, in Alamosa, Colorado. And that's a really small town, just a college town. It's like a town of 10,000 people when the college is there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the highest elevation football stadium in the country. If, if that, for a little trivia. Oh, wow. Um, it also is, is in a valley at this height, I think it's like 7,500 feet above sea level. And it had this incredible, it was a desert, so it had these incredible, like, temperature swings where it'd be, like, um, uh, 60 degrees during the day and negative 20 at night. Just, like, a crazy, weird place, kind of. And it was getting into the fall, and it was our last semester at college with me and my buddy Joe Barnett. And, you know, last semester of college, you take the, the last few things you need for your, your degree, but you also have, mm-hmm. like, you could take just whatever, kind of, there's some elective classes and we had this one class, and we saw it. We were take, we're gonna me and my buddy were gonna take all the film classes we can. We weren't film. He was a history major. I was an English major. But we'll take whatever film things we do just to watch movies and get a credit for it. And we went and we saw this thing called Demagogues and Democracy, which was a it was a film class about for demagog demagogues. And oh. the the only one I can remember is Facing the Crowd, uh, the the, yeah. the the movie with the guy that becomes the, the mayor or whatever. I haven't seen it in a long time. If, if you've mm-hmm. seen, it's really good. I think I saw it in film school, so it's been a long time for me too. Yeah, yeah. I should re- I should rewatch that. Uh, mm-hmm. But that's but and also like th- this class is the only thing I remember from it. So we go to week one and let's say we watch Face in the Crowd, and it was weird because every other class, like every other class in in college that we've taken, and I was there for two, for two years. My buddy Joe was there all four years, and um, was just normal hours, like it was you know from seven in the morning till five or whatever did you need to get your own schedule and all stuff but this class was at eight o'clock at night and it was in the english building at the fourth floor and it was when just no other classes were going on so when we went there to the class you just walk up the stairs and it was empty and usually it's there you know people are there all day we walk in the classroom there was a uh, professor that we'd never seen before a guy named professor uh gornick and um he was an odd guy but he was kind of talking about the thing and there was only five other people in the class besides me and my buddy Joe. Mm-hmm. And we watched the movie. We talked about it after the thing. Uh, and that was kind of it. We went home. And then the next the next week, we're getting ready to go to this class. And this is where we kind of get this is where it gets kind of weird. And, and we're, we're, me and Joe were talking. He's like, man, that class is kind of weird last week. And he goes, it was a little weird. It had like a little odd vibe to it. Like, what was, what was that about? And they go like, you know, I, 
You've been here four years. I've been here two years. Have you ever heard of Professor Gornick? And then he goes like, no, I've never had a class with him. I've never had a never had a teacher talk about him. I've never a student talk about him. Like, neither have I. And it's so weird that we're in the history and English department. And this is the history English building. We don't know this, you know, teacher or professor. Mm-hmm. And then we go like, do you know any of those other kids in the class? And he goes like, no. I never met and like everybody in that class, and we're like we're seniors in college. It's a small town. You know everybody. We do not know a single other person in the class, and we're and and then now we're now we're like walking towards the class, and and because you can walk everywhere here, and it's a bit of a long walk, and it's fall, and it's dark, and we're we're chatting, and we're just like, and we're like, so Gornick, we never met these five kids, we've never met, and I'm like. I'm like, over the years, how many kids die at a college? Like, at a, on average, like, how many kids just, like, die or whatever in the thing? And we're like, I don't know, we're talking about it. And then we just start going, like, I think, I think we're in a class with ghosts from this college. And, and it's, I, I and we laughed, and that's a joke, it's a joke, right? It's so funny. Yeah. And then we kept on going on about, like, how just, like, oh, yeah, this kid died from this, and now he's in this class, this kid died from this, now he's in this class, and Gornick fell down the stairs, he died from this class. And so then, then we go and we open up the door and we start walking up the stairs and like Joe stops and he gets really like he's truly like he's just his eyes get big. He's big as soft. And he goes like, I know we're joking, but what if that is real? And we're like looking around at this empty building and we're like, oh, I, I I'm like, I don't I don't think it's real, Joe. I think it's like, he goes, I don't know. I got a bad feeling. He's kind of a religious guy. I got a bad feeling. I don't know. I just got a bad. We should go, dude. We should go. And I'm like, dude. We're not going to go because our class might be filled with ghosts. Um, and then he really is like, he goes, no, I don't know. Eventually we talk him into it. He goes, continue up the stairs. And we turn the corner and there's like nobody in the hallway. And we walk down, boom, we go to the door. And to my life, we, we open the door and the classroom's completely empty. And we like, it's eight o'clock. It's Wednesday. This is the class. And the class is gone. And there's nobody there. What? And we're just like, what the, f-? and we, we just like, like and and like we were worked up in a way that we were like oh no and we're like no and we're like ah and we like run down the stairs and we like run home and we're like oh my god oh my god they're dead they're oh my god this class isn't real we're taking a fake class with ghosts we're like freaking out uh and it was so crazy uh and then we checked our emails and professor gornick had the flu that day and he wasn't gonna go in and we pushed the class that week but <laughs> To that moment was it was absolutely real, Michael. That there was like yeah. we thought that I mean it felt it felt like we stepped into like a ghost class. It was still like yeah. a creepy class, but yeah, it was it's... that it, it was that feeling of how much you could get worked up. Like if you just if you just like buy in a little bit, uh, it, it was because it was it was real spooks and scares from us. Uh, absolutely, and I, I think how you buy into those things. And the talking about it and the building, you were building a belief system, essentially. And then you go into the room and it's there. I I was going to ask, not knowing what the ending was going to be, I was going to ask if you thought there was some kind of correlation to the face in the crowd. Is that what the movie is called that you saw? Yes. Yeah. If there was some kind of correlation with that to to whatever experience was about to happen. But of course, that was before the end. (laughs) Um, And I think my memory, what a face in the crowd. I think I'm thinking of a Lon Chaney movie. I'm thinking of something else that maybe the smiling man. I don't think I'm thinking of a face in the crowd. Well, the thing about um, a face in the crowd, it's, it's, uh, it, it's the, the star is somebody who is a normal. It's Andy Griffith is the star and he oh, plays like this oh. evil man. And it's like, and that's what makes that really good. Cause he's like this charismatic guy who yeah. whips up the town into all this like bad stuff. And then he, um, uh, but, but, he, but it's Andy Griffith. Right. And so it's like a really bizarre yeah. thing to see him in that. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so did you ever see Gornick teaching any other classes after the moment when it, when the reality of what this was hit you? Did you see him on other lists or, or you know schedules or anything like that? I mean, to be honest, he might have been like a retired faculty member who just came back to just do something like this. But no, I've yeah. like never seen Gornick outside of this anyway. So he was kind of like it was like an odd duck guy. Um, and the kids we did get to know, they were just. Um, uh, uh, I guess 
I guess dorks, I guess they were just, they, they, they were not out and about in the town and that's why we didn't know them. There was no, there was no special reason for this. It was just yeah. that we just didn't know these, these five other kids. And then we did know Gornick and it was just like, and I, and I guess at that, that time, like we're seniors and we're, we're, you know, me and Joe Barnett are yeah. knuckleheads. Like we're the we guy, I specifically got in so much trouble with this guy. We, um, we stole an ambulance once. <laughs> um, <laughs> Back in my, I mean, like I told you, like Alamosa got to negative 20 degrees. And so we're walking mm -hmm. along, we walk by the hospital and we're well hammered. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a, there is a, there is a warm running ambulance in front of the hospital. And he goes, hop in. And he hops in the driver's seat. And I hop into the passenger seat and we start going and we're driving towards the house. And I go, Joe, what happens when we wake up? And there's a hot, there's an ambulance in front of the house. He goes, whoo, that would be a bad idea, Matt. And we both hopped out, left the ambulance where it was and just ran. Like that was the kind of trouble. So me and me and Barnett would, uh, let's just say we'd, we'd let our, our flights of fancy get ahead of us a lot in a lot of different yep. ways. A lot yep. of bad decisions, a lot of bad <laughs> ideas. So ghost sex, she wasn't even the worst one, I guess I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I love it. It's, this is a very twilight zone story, which I will always love. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. I, I, Cause I'm sure you have like people telling like real true, like scary story stuff, but it was, but it, cause like what I'm telling you is that like this felt, I mean, it, it's stupid and it's a shaggy dog story, but it, this felt so scary. One of the things that I'm really interested in when it comes to real stories is how things in your own like belief system or what you're doing affects what yeah. you're seeing. Well, if you're, if your brain, like I said, if, if where our brain state was at that point, if there was like one puff of mist that, or like some, some windy mist that blew by in front of us after that, after we revealed that they weren't there, we would have said that was Gornick. We saw Gornick's mm -hmm. ghost because we were at that, that 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 state that we were at. We're so yeah. impressionable, so excitable. Any bit of evidence that would have like led us to like this is also this missing professor and these missing kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we yeah. saw them here. I made a comment. I, I did an episode with my friend Brandy Stillwell, and she's somebody that has experienced a lot of paranormal phenomena in her life. And so I had her just share some like random stories from her life to discuss these kind of things. And one of the things I talked about is that there are many scientific studies that have happened where professors of anthropology and history and psychology and stuff, they'll have students over to a house or, or a, you know, a, some sort of place. And they're like, hey, tonight we're going to stay here. Uh, by the way, the place is haunted. This woman killed herself in the hallway and blah, 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 blah. And they tell the story. And then sure enough, the next morning, people will be, I saw the lady that killed herself. And then you find out later, no, it was a study. No one ever died here. No one killed themselves. But yet all these people suddenly see it because they were building it up in their mind. So you guys kind of did that to yourselves. You yeah. did a little science experiment you know, on yourselves without realizing it. Well, it is like the, um, I, I cause I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not experiencing any paranormal stuff. And I kind of generally don't, I believe it is all like brain tricks and all this stuff in that mm -hmm. way. But I still think about doing like the, the bloody Mary thing in the mirror. And that yeah, is so yeah. scary to do. Um, yep. in, uh, Alaska native culture, there's a thing about, you don't whistle at the Northern lights because mm -hmm. if you do, it'll come and cut your head off, which is, I think is a oh. cool spooky story. Um, and then, so like, just to test it out, I whistled at the Northern lights and then it just, there's that moment when you do it, it's just like, Oh, I transgressed uh -oh. something yep. and something bad could happen. And that, and mm -hmm. it's weird because it's just like, you're, it's literally in the universal scale, nothing, but, um, your brain can just whip everything into something that feels as real as anything. Uh, absolutely. A hundred percent it can. And that's, you know, that's part of my fascination in this stuff. So uh, I don't want to take any more of your time, but do you want to plug anything that you have coming out or anything that's already out? Do you want to, you know, stand on a soapbox and, and say something while you're, oh, <laughs> you're being I'll, recorded? I'll always, I'll, I'll always take a plug, man. Uh, yeah. Follow me uh, at Matt Mazzani on Twitter. Follow me at Matt Mazzani on Instagram. Watch The Con on ABC. It's, all, it's on Hulu now, but uh, I directed all the recreations for that show, which is a lot of fun. Uh, also listen to Get It Again, a wrestling podcast where... Me and some other oh. knuckleheads, we we watched WCW Thunder from start to finish, and we're we're well into 1999, and that's been a very fun journey. Oh, that's awesome! That's yeah. awesome! I didn't know you did that. I'm so glad you I gave you an opportunity to plug that because that's that's really cool. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah.
Well, thank you so much for being on, Matt, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for listening to the first part of our two-part Terrifying Tales Halloween special episodes. Next week, the Tuesday before Halloween, we're dropping the second part, and there's going to be people like Molly Elfman and Zeke Pinero and Joe Russo and myself sharing a story of the most frightening thing that's ever happened to me. In fact, the way I kind of organize these episodes is next week about 60% of the stories involve me and that's not necessarily a good thing for myself because i'm the one listening through these things after i even record them uh and it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of spooky it's kind of spooky i gotta be honest uh but anyway i hope you enjoy please make sure to subscribe rate and review a study of strange thank you for everybody that's done so and also as a reminder a couple of the interviews from tonight's episode as well as next week's episode will be available on Patreon in its entirety, unedited. There's at least three as of this moment that are going up there. So check those out and support the show. Follow us on Instagram at A Study of Strange. Email me thoughts, ideas, stories, anything you want at A Study of Strange at gmail.com. Visit our website, A Study of Strange.com. I can't wait to get back to some true crime in a couple of weeks. I am going to be dark the week after Halloween but back right after that with more strange, true tales. Thank you, and good night.